thank you the judges for uh, your time and efforts so we'd move on to the most interesting session of the icon conference this is something which we came up after i attended the uh, session in uh, singapore that's on narrative medicines all of us know that stories can move us stories are very powerful medium for learning so we wanted our children to learn storytelling and they want we wanted them to share with us what they think as very powerful stories which can motivate and we also had this uh, small uh, idea in the back of our mind we wanted them to learn the history of medicine we wanted them to appreciate that they are standing on the shoulders of people who have struggled and uh, the giants who have made this possible now it might look so easy but uh, we wanted them to appreciate where they are so we introduced this session called as uh, the defining moment in the history of medicine and uh, what how else we can name this session rather than after sir william masler so we wanted to call this session as sir william masler award for the defining moment in the history of medicine and that's how this session came about and we had quite a enthusiastic participations this was open only to undergraduate students we had uh, 16 i think responses received and uh, our scientific team had to really crop through and then we came up with this 10 presentations so to moderate this session and to judge the best awards we call upon dr sanjeev luin i know this is some cause which is very close to his heart and the moment i asked him he said yes we have with us uh, dr alka segal who is a professor of oji from chandigarh and the third uh, resource person for this is dr shanti ak uh dr kadambari was supposed to join us because of her ill health she is not able to attend today's session so i pass on the session to the judges sanjeev sir sal yas the rules of this is the students have been asked to make their presentations in the oral format they can use two slides with pictures data or infographics but no text is allowed and uh, each student gets 4 minutes for presentation and 2 minutes for questioning we'll strictly maintain time for the interests of uh, activity because we all have to go for uh, conference dinner at 7:30 today right i've sent you the invite in the whatsapp so the first participant of so good evening everybody uh, without uh, wasting more time uh, we'll hand over to the uh, mc who will conduct the session uh, we have before us uh, 10 marks into 4 that is 40 marks and we'll be grading them on the chosen moment ability to explain appropriateness of aids use and presentation style over to you ma'am yes sir thank you sir so the first part participant of this session uh, i call miss chie owa her uh, registration id is 157 akita university akita Japan. university in china no, sir, Japan. Japan. <laughs> i would like to speak to the editor please <laughs> my name is cheo ya i am a medical school student in japan it is a great honor to able to speak to you today today i'd like to talk about how covid-19 changes our lifestyle the mental health of youth the covid-19 pandemic has significantly altered our lifestyles japanese government emphasizes the importance of avoiding three c's the term three c's is a coined expression referring to starting with c close spaces crowded places and close contact settings 
This shift of lifestyle has a profound impact on the mental health of youth. My sister is one of those affected. She experienced a severe stress due to the COVID-19 related restrictions. As a result, she became a school refusal. Furthermore, the alma mater of my sister and me experienced the increase of suicide cases every year. These two events prompted on my reflection on the young people's mental health issues led by COVID-19. One research in Japan says, the main factor of the increase in suicide cases is mental impact due to the changes of lifestyles. As an example, the shift of daily lives, I cite silent eating. Silent eating means no talking during meal times. Japanese government implemented silent eating in school lunch times. There has a negative impact on children's well-being. Nevertheless, one article in Japan implies that silent eating has no potential to control the outbreaks of infectious diseases. This inconsistency prompted a question on my mind. Should our, approach, should our main approach be isolation or should be considered to mitigate the impact it has on humanity? The quick answer is we should do both. Actually, several interventions were conducted as a part of our mental health initiatives. For example, in my university, mental health assessment are conducted during stay home order mandated in 2019. Then, the student who had the strong symptoms of depression connected to specialist. At another university, the, um, at another university, counseling hotlines were established specifically for night time. It was established considering the vulnerability of mental health issues during night time. In this way, the COVID-19 has reshaped the mental health support infrastructure in healthcare. It has transformed the awareness of psychiatrists and university faculty in supporting students. Personally, I became consciously aware of mental health of friends and siblings. There has been a significant realization for my future role as a medical healthcare professional. I believe these developments mark a defining and historical moment in medicine. By reflecting on my experiences, I hope to contemplate the well-being of individuals in the COVID-19 era. That's all. Thank you. See, you said it has affected you, but how do you intend to put it into practice? You, you talked about certain uh, factors. Yeah. Which factor has affected you most and how you are going to implement it? Yes. Mm. Mm. I experienced feeling of loneliness. And for example, we had uh, restrictions on the number of people in the operating rooms and inability to perform physical examination. But for, fortunately, I was able to gain experience in all medical specialties, specialties. But 
some of my friends cannot experience in certain departments. Yeah, you have explained how it has affected the mental health, but you have not uh, clearly explained how it has changed the practice, mm -hmm. how it has altered the practice of medicine. The um, internship in medicine, right? In the medical field. In the medical field. The, um, for example, we can't experience the she, uh, can, I, can I clarify? Yep. We are asking you, how does your observations change practice of medicine when you become a doctor? Um, how your observations, yeah, yeah. going forward, what do you think you'll do if you have a COVID-21, yes. a new COVID? Yeah, yeah. How do you think you would deal with it? Uh, how COVID-19 has change my opinion to be a doctor. In to future, what the, would you do? Ah, uh, yes. Mm, before the COVID-19, I really want to be an anesthesiologist in the future. But because of the COVID-19, I really want to help the people suffering from infectious diseases. So I altered, I changed my specialty to be in the future to infectious disease department. Yeah. Okay, fine. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I call upon the next participant, Mr. Surya from Government uh, Kadlur Medical College. His ID is 194. One nine four. Certainly, certainly. Come, ma'am. Say good, ma'am. His ID is 194 from Kadlur Medical College. So good evening to everyone present here. So I am Surya from Government Kadlur Medical College. And now let's start the session. So this is a story of a man who saved countless number of lives and spared a number of women and children from agonizing death. The year was 1846, and our would-be Hungarian physician is Dr. Ignis Semmelweis. It was the start of the golden age of the physician scientists, where physicians were expected to have scientific training. So doctors like Semmelweis were no longer thinking of the miasma theory. They instead looked at anatomy, and autopsies became more common, and the doctors were more into numbers and collecting data. Dr. Semmelweis was no ex exception. When he showed up for his new job in a maternal clinic in General Vienna Hospital, he wanted to figure out why so many women were dying in the maternity wards, uh, which was staffed by the male doctors, rather than the another clinic, which was staffed by the female midwives. So he studied both the maternity wards, and he wanted to discover, find out why the death rate was five times higher in the first clinic, which was staffed by the medical professionals, while the death rate was so low in the clinics, which was staffed by the midwives. 
So Semmelweis went through the differences and he compared the number of death and the mortality rate between the two clinics and he started ruling up ideas. No ideas made a big difference. But this one moment became the landmark of this great discovery. One of his colleagues, a pathologist, died due to an illness because, after, because he did an autopsy with an injured finger. This is sad, but let me go on. Samuelois studied the pathologist's corpse and realized that he died from the same disease as the women in the maternity wards. This was a revelation. Pure puerperal fever wasn't something only women during childbirth got sick from. It was something other people in the hospital could get sick from as well. So the big difference between those two wards is that the doctors were doing autopsies before treating the patients, where the midwives weren't. So Semmelweis hypothesized that there were some cadaverous particles which was carried by the medical professionals after the autopsies and it was transmitted to the women in the maternal clinics. So with this hypothesis in mind, he ordered his medical staffs to start cleaning the hands. So this is the start of the hand washing technique. And instruments not just with soap, but with the use of chlorinated lime water. Semmelweis didn't know anything about germs. He chose this because of the one reason, because it removed the bad odor of the corpse particles in the, the hands. And when he imposed this, the maternity rate just fell dramatically. You would think everyone would be thrilled Semmelweis had solved the problem, but they weren't. For one thing, doctors were upset because Semmelweis made it look like they were the ones giving the disease to the mothers. And Semmelweis was not very tactful. He publicly berated people who disagreed with this, and he made some influential enemies on his way. But eventually, the doctors gave up the chlorine hand washing techniques because they weren't okay with Semmelweis giving the idea. And finally, Semmelweis lost his job. Semmelweis kept trying to convince other doctors and physicians in the other parts of Europe to wash their hands with the use of chlorine, but no one would listen. So, in the end, Semmelweis was admitted to a mental asylum for his mental illness, where he died of sepsis. The one disease our hero fought so hard through his entire life to save the countless lives of mothers and children. Although the remarkable discovery of antisepsis and hand washing techniques was recognized only after the introduction of germ theory by Louis Pasteur and Joseph Lister. His contribution has helped an everlasting mark on the modern healthcare practice and helped prevent countless preventable deaths. Hence, washing hands saves lives. Thank you. So we all know the significance of hand washing by now. I want you to tell me, see, somebody found it absurd, and the reaction, whatever the reaction was, the outcome you have shown. Now, if you see something of that kind, yeah. or somebody's suggestion, mm. which sounds absurd to most of the people, what will be your reaction? After knowing this, that, you know, in the long term, something, you know, useful may be actually coming out of what it sounds to be absurd now. So what will be your reaction? You got my point? Yeah, can you repeat it one more course? I didn't get it. Somebody found this mm. suggestion of hand washing absurd. Okay. So there was so much of an opposition, so yeah. much of, and you've seen the end result. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Today, I want your reaction to be told to the mm. public. If you found somebody is giving some suggestion, which some others are sounding you know, it sounds absurd. The others are labeling it as an absurd finding. What will be your reaction? So if I find out some kind of this kind of discovery that changes the impact of my health in the world, my thing would be like approach other people or a wide group of people, like publish it in the scientific societies or teach the findings to the younger generations or, the, or write it as a research paper or something. And give it up for the upcoming generations because I just want this idea to be up in the public. I just don't want to take the credit. That's all. I expected <coughs> that you would validate it. Okay. It was a good presentation and it is definitely a defining moment in history. What do you think Samuel Weiss could have done? Could have done. Could have done. 
to put us theory into practice then he actually did put his theory into practice because after uh, he uh, persuaded the doctors in europe he actually started his own clinic and he was a obstetrics uh, he was a gynecologist and he practiced this thing that's why it became more popular among his students because they were the ones who took this forward and they made, made this more popular because so similar is i think he did the right thing certainly a very historical significant yeah. uh, event a very i did not know about him so i read up on him so certainly change the practice of medicine mm. i love your diagrams thank you so much sir. but you are in trouble what is the differential diagnosis of his death so actually do you know what what he started doing you you're right he went into a mental asylum yeah, he got sepsis and died because of hmm. some gangrenous problem gangrenous. but why did he land up in a mental asylum because fellow homework fellow physician why were uh, they weren't okay with samuel was giving that idea because and they wanted to admit him to the new asylum okay you got homework to do i, I want to know what underlying disease was suspected yeah sure well done thank you so much thank you the next participant mr arun pravin he is also from government medical college kadlur his id is 199 199 he is supposed to have died from syphilis gpi syphilis bar alzheimers because he went berserk good morning all i am arun pravin from government kadlur medical college no need to touch the core which meant do not touch the heart was the prevailing doctrine a fear that an organ like a heart which was too vital too complex and central to be operated upon was the scenario imagine in a world where the most common childhood illness affecting 1 in 100 children were just doomed to die without any treatment even the children who were alive had to be in a squatting position their entire waking hours just to squeeze out the remaining blood and oxygen from their legs legs to their lungs to be able to just breathe comfortably dr helen b tosig a pediatric cardiologist was about to change the scene she herself suffered from childhood dyslexia and progressive hearing loss and had to rise against white male dominated institute she was about to change the field once and forever after she uh, observed a series of cases of congenital heart disease children who had fewer symptoms and a longer life span if their ductus arteriosus just remained open she had an epiphany and she approached dr blaylock to propose a surgical solution by creating a shunt an attempt to change the course of the blood in the body something that has been never been done before dr blaylock along with surgical heart technician dr vivian thomas experimented on about 200 dog mod animal models to perfect the surgery on a fine day a 15 month old blue baby named ellie saxon was about to be the first person to undergo cardiac surgery with skeptical surgeon keenly observing from the gallery a long and delicate heart surgery was done as the final sutures were being made and as dr blaylock closed removed the clamp a startled exclamation from the resident anesthesiologist was heard now you must be able to see the change in color of the side the baby's cheeks and lips changed from icy blue to a to a healthy pink blush dr blaylock and tosic were successful they published their findings and they traveled around the world to share their diagnostic and surgical expertise hearing the news parents around the world had traveled to the john hopkins center for treatment around 15000 children were directly benefited by the blaylock thomas tosic shunt operation tosic summarized her work on fluoroscopy for diagnosis and using ecg and all her clinical expertise on a book called the congenital malformations of the heart which became the foundation for pediatric cardiology later tosic also initiated various pediatric cardiology centers around america in which she mentored india's first female cardiologist 
Padma Vibhushan, Dr. S.A. Padmavati. Later in her life, Tosik was also pivotal in banning teratogen thalidomide and promoted rigorous drug testing in the FDA. In a time when surgeons feared operating on the heart, these three doctors sailed the uncharted territories and in the following decades, they encouraged rapid development of palliative and curative surgeries in congenital heart diseases. In a sense, this was not only the beginning of pediatric cardiology as a subspecialty, it was the dawn and the birth of cardiac surgery. Thank you, everyone. So, uh, wonderful graphs, lot of nice photographs, maybe a few more extra, yes, but interesting. Definitely a very historical significant uh, thing. Did change practice of medicine palliatively. I'm just curious to know, what's her connection to an Indian pediatric cardiologist who died in 100, at 102 Three, years? Yeah, uh, uh, in, uh, she, uh, Dr. Tosik was the mentor for the first uh, Dr. Padma Vibhushan S.A. Padmavati. She, uh, she initiated the American Indian Heart Association and she also introduced DM cardiology course in India. So. This is, of course, cardiology and the and, and, uh, yes. pediatric cardiology starting. Mm -hmm. Any infectious disease you can think of which uh, or some other preventive measures which in heart disease yes. in pediatric age group have been later on added? Tosik was initially working on rheumatic heart diseases and um, but later she shifted the focus to congenital heart disease because it was not being treated well and it, there were not, no attention was given because it didn't have any diagnosis protocol, neither it had any treatment. So she changed it later. Any, any preventive measures you can think of for heart disease? Because now it has become a yes. branch in itself. Yes. You pick up something in siblings, something preventive possible? It may be a difficult question for you, but... Mainly rheumatic heart disease was... No, there are many... Okay. Many more. In fact, uh, there are some medical diseases which are known to cause congenital heart disease. Yes. Okay. And uh, you can prevent them in okay. today's era by preventing the disease or controlling the disease okay. before pregnancy. Yeah. Okay. So. <laughs> yeah. <Yes>. So. <laughs> Neonatal sepsis. <laughs> congenital being in, being an obstetrician. Tart syndrome, Anil uh, Rubala yes. syndrome. You can give MR vaccine for it. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next participant, Mr. Pratham L. Prakash from Velamal Medical College. His ID is 155155. Good afternoon to one and all present here. I am Prathamil Prakash, here to talk about the role of statistics in medicine. So medical statistics is the science of summarizing, collecting, presenting and identifying data in medical practice and using them to estimate the magnitude of associations and to test hypotheses. So the practice of data collection has been in the medical field and it is seen as early as 4,000 years ago in civilizations like the Egyptian civilization and the Greek civilizations. And it was used for instructional and educational purposes. But it wasn't until the 17th century that John Gron would analyze the data in London and extrapolate it and to produce the first ever life table and which he called bills of mortality. In the 18th century, James Lynn, a Royal Navy surgeon, carried out the first ever recorded clinical trials by feeding sailors affected with scurvy six different treatments and he found out that factors present in citrus fruits helped where other foods did not. So this is one of the first times that a trial was done in a systematic manner with, with identifiable data collection. In the 19th century, Ignaz Semmelweis identified a trend in patients that contracted childbed fever 
and deduced that the cause for this childhood fever was the unhygienic methods exercised by his peers by delivering the infants right after cadaveric dissections, which caused the cadaveric particles to enter the mother's body, leading to death. The hospital that Semmelweis worked in coincidentally had the perfect conditions for an experiment where he was able to compare the data between the midwife wards and the doctor wards and arrive at this conclusion. Around the same time in London, Florence Nightingale, a nurse, used statistical methods to analyze and present the data on mortality and morbidity of the patients involved and formed a visual representation, which was called a polar area diagram, to monitor and assess patient deaths, which provided better treatment and prevented deaths during the Crimean War. Nightingale's work helped to highlight the importance of using statistics to improve public health and healthcare practices. But the defining moment that helped reshape the medical scene was Carl Pearson's publication titled Statistics on Inoculation for Enteric Fever, which is served as the foundational for medical statistics. Carl Pearson also influenced the work of Austin Bradford Hill, who wrote the principles of medical statistics, which is widely associated with the birth of modern medical statistics. Medical statistics has helped healthcare professionals to assess the effectiveness of a line of treatment in populations, as seen in the work of Pierre Alexander Charles Lewis on typhoid and diphtheria, which showed that bleeding, the most important medical therapeutic tool of the time, was not beneficial in the treatment of these diseases. Medical statistics has helped healthcare professionals to assess the prevalence of an epidemic the and the rate and spread in a population by identifying and predicting susceptible and inf in infected populations and a viable mode of control for the disease to prevent further spread. The early 20th century saw the establishment of dedicated departments for inst and institutes for medical statistics and epidemiology, reflecting its importance in the medical field for public care and health. Within the realm of medical statistics, numbers narrate the journey from uncertainty to understanding, paving the way for healthier tomorrows. Thank you. Well, uh, you made a point, good presentation, because uh, defining moments are usually clinically related uh, <coughs> points. And this is something that will help the public health, yes, will improve the public health statistics. So that way it's really defining. And uh, do you think all defining moments in medicine have taken the help of statistics? No, ma'am. All defining, uh, all medical, like, revolutions have not, in like, they don't have a correlation with statistics. But, like, statistics is, is like the support. Like, you, when you directly intervene with a patient, you are providing healthcare. But statistics helps prevent that situation from occurring or it helps in identifying how we can prevent that situation from further occurring. For example, without the help of statistics, the COVID epidemic, because of uh, which would have been a much more worse scenario because we wouldn't know how to control it. But because medical statistics is in play, we were able to control it by um, identifying the point of transmission and by cutting those off. Well, you have attempted uh, the answer well. Can statistics be misleading also? Yes, ma'am, definitely. Statistics can be misleading is if the sample size is very small, inherent bias in the, uh, in the individual conducting the research, it can lead to very, very bad effects because in that case, you are basically getting bogus. And if you are going to follow that, then you could end up causing more harm than good. So to, to battle those is why we have uh, that says something and everybody follows that. We need like backed up by hard evidence and also logic, logic as to why that evidence works. 
and also it needs to be reviewed by multiple people so that we can arrive at a conclusion. Uh, loved your choice of topic. Thank you. I'm not I finish this question first. Love your choice of topic. How small is small? You said some small number will be devious. How small is small? What number of sample do you want, which will be adequate for your study? Small is. Is 0 0.00001 or statistically significant? <laughs> Very good answer. None of the above. <laughs> Ota. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, next, Miss Jane Prabha Shalom from Sri Manakula Vinayaka Medical College. Her ID is 245. 245. Vaccines. Good evening to one and all gathered here. Greetings from Sri Manakla Vinayaka Medical College. This is Jane Prabha Shalom. So, my topic for the theme is vaccines in a faster lane. We all had faced a global pandemic called COVID-19 during December. Millions of individuals died from young to old, including our dear and loved ones. It was one of the greatest disaster we had ever faced. And for this solution, vaccination was an unwavering solution to be accompanied through. Also, because COVID-19 was new, coronaviruses are not. Scientists have been studying about coronaviruses and mRNA for more than 50 years. Clinical trials of mRNA and lipid nanoparticle coated formulations of cancer immunotherapies and viral vaccines were also being studies. Coming to the traditional vaccines here, it consists of preclinical phase, phases 1, 2 and 3 along with their studies. Whereas COVID-19 vaccine, it took only 12 to 24 months to develop. But how it occurred? The genetic code was obtained from previously encountered MERS and SARS coronaviruses. And remember one thing, our scientists didn't skip any steps, but they overlapped it. Vaccine approval was hastened by Food Drug Administration and Emergency Usage Authorization after ensuring its safety, efficacy and quality. World's first COVID-19 vaccine, which is a lipid nanoparticle coated mRNA vaccine was launched on December 2020 named mRNA1273 by Moderna and BNT162B2 by Pfizer. Actually prevented more than 51 millions of deaths as per predictions. Also, it allows researchers to create vaccines for emerging viral diseases, cancers, and other genetic disorders. Quoting from one of the greatest American astronauts, Neil Armstrong said, This one small step of a man is a much bigger milestone for a greater mankind means there was an exciting news in 2023. Nobel Prize was awarded to Catalin Karikov and Drew Weisman for medicine and physiology field for the phenomenal contribution to develop the above mentioned vaccines, which helped us to fight against the COVID pandemic. And I thank you one and all. 
once again for your patience. So, uh, certainly mRNA, a uh, very important uh, new process in vaccine. It did really speed up vaccines. Uh, thank you for choosing that topic. My question Welcome, to you sir. is, why was it not used before? What was the problem? Why? How come now suddenly you need vaccine, you use it? What happened to it? It was there along, no? What was wrong with it? Uh, due if to the way. improvement of technology, we are able to speed up the vaccine production. Though it was, it was there, vaccines were there, but due to the development of science and technology, we can able to achieve this. Was there a problem with mRNA te technology before? No, definitely not. Because okay. scientists have been... Okay. Okay. Say good uh, choice of topic. Thank you, ma'am. But uh, can you please tell me what you meant by phase one, two, and three? Sure, ma'am. So, how phase they clubbed it? Okay, ma'am. How it For was different in making this COVID vaccine? Actually, phase one in traditional vaccine takes... 30 months, phase 2 takes 32 months, phase 3 takes 30 months again. In COVID vaccine development, phase 1, that is preclinical trial, I mean preclinical trial takes 2 months, they club phase 1, 2, 3 for 6 months and for manufacturing and deployment of vaccine, they took 2 months. What complication is now being suggested to be correlated to? COVID vaccine or maybe the disease itself. We do uh, not know, but there is a strong correlation which is being suspected. For mostly mRNA vaccines can cause thrombosis, stroke, pulmonary embolism. So how can we, uh, you know, calculate whether this was related to the disease or to the vaccine for future use of similar kind of vaccines in by giving a categorical proof, we can able to calculate it, ma'am. So did you see this performer which was being structured for evaluating the impact of vaccine? Sorry, ma'am, I there was any? not aware no. at it. So very long-term impacts have not been included in that performer. What one can still do, what you, you, you could have suggested was that we could compare still the stroke or other complications prior to the vaccine use and now happening in the current era. So that could be a still be a good comparison. Okay, ma'am. Enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Except you'll have to fall back on statistics. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Next participant, Mr. Navin Jacob from PIMS. And his ID is 267. 267. Hello. Good evening, everyone. Esteemed judges, fellow participants through this amazing moment in history of medicals. And my name is Naveen Jacob. I'm from Pondicherry Institute of Medical Sciences. And my topic is about anesthesia, the revelation of, thank you, revelation of anesthesia. You know what I think? I think anesthesia is a, it's a liberation for mankind, an ethereal liberation. Let me take you back to a time when there was no anesthesia. I'd like you all to think about how the time was back then, when there was no, when there was no, like a cure or anything to help uh, so people suffering from surgical pain. So, okay, thank you. There was this doctor named Wallace, and. He was the first person to uh, experiment with uh, 
anesthetic products. He was a dentist himself and he tried it on himself. The first thing he tried was nitric oxide. He tried it, also called as laughing gas. He tried it with him. And he, he made himself successful. But when he tried to publicly prove it to others, the patient who, uh, who he was trying on said it was painful and he was discarded and stoned for it. Then another doctor, a friend of his named William Morton, he was the one who helped him in uh, co-joining the nitric oxide with Esther. And this time the results were astonishing and he made a point. But still, because it was his invention, Mr. Wallace let it slide to William. Now, now let us come to what happened after anesthesia. The, the pain and suffering and screams of everyone, it had ended. There was no more pain except for after the surgical process. That too was cured and curated by them. Even in ancient times, Indians used to use anesthetic products, but it was not as esteemed and acceptable by most because they were using cannabis and opium for it. This was same as before when they had no chloroform and other. Okay. And the products used by in the ancient prehistoric time were alcohol and other non-acceptable by our terms right now. Imagine giving alcohol to a person before surgery right now. <laughs> yep. So our modern inventions is what changed us and made us susceptible to the anesthesia. Well done. Okay. Yeah. Come near the mic so you can answer. That mic. Go to the mic. Yeah. Let us now know from you how modern it is. How many super specializations have been started in anesthesia without alcohol taking, without taking alcohol? <laughs> Just to be on the lighter side. Super specializations, they have uh, modernized in local anesthetics, which uh, paralyzes the whole thing, and specific anesthetics, which just can be used for particular places. Like in, uh, in dentists use it often, often more than in surgical purpose. In your opinion, and the opinion of the scientific community, which is the, mo the t most terrible pain? It's the ultimate in pain. Give me two examples. And don't look at me, <laughs> and don't look at her. <laughs> the ultimate so. pain. And they rarely give. I get, for my problem, I get anesthesia. But her problem, <laughs> Maybe now they get. Yeah, but and for talk of pain in love. <laughs> for <laughs> labor pain, I don't think there is no. You have no experience to answer that. Agreed. <laughs> okay, so one is labor pain, other is a dentist, ma'am. Last question. Yeah, last question. You said opium and all were used. Do you yes, think they are not used in these days? Yes, ma'am. Of course, they are used, but. Huh? Uh, they are trying to banish it and of course we are not going to use it for medical purposes. They are not used? I I don't she thinks it's used for medical purposes. Yes. That's why she's smiling. <laughs> Is opium used for medical purposes today? Uh, no ma'am, I don't think it's... 
Good evening, everyone. I'm Varsha Maurya, and I'm here to talk about a defining moment in medicine. A moment so defining that I'm pretty sure that every one of you here has been affected by it. Before that, really quickly, I want to talk about one particular day, March 8th of 2014. Two things happened that day. Number one, I turned nine years old. More importantly, number two, the Malaysian Airlines uh, flight uh, 370 from Kuala Lumpur to Beijing uh, with 345 passengers in it was lost at sea, the search for which is still actively on. Now, imagine two such jumbo jets, right? Imagine two such jumbo jets get destroyed every day, killing all of its occupants for a whole year straight. Now, what if I tell you that that is the number of people that died due to adverse healthcare-related errors every year? Seems startling, isn't it? Not really if you take a step back and think about it. Over 2,000 years ago, Hippocrates, the father of medicine, said, primum non nociere, which translates to, first, do no harm. Why did he say that? Well, because the practice of medicine is fraught with a lot of dangers. For example, you had the barber surgeons and their tools of trade. Um, you had non-standardized medicine practices and recommendations by quacks. You had um, uh, bloodletting was a huge thing. You had surgeries without anesthesia. You had asepsis. I could go on and on. Uh, all healthcare professionals were aware of the fact that harm can, occur due to harm can occur to patients during the process of care, but they did not realize the magnitude of such a problem. That happened in 1999, when Harvard Medical School published the IOM report to Air is Human, the first comprehensive report on healthcare-related disabilities and deaths. According to this report, more than 98,000 people die every year due to healthcare-related errors. This is second only to road traffic accidents and cancers in the USA. The report talked about the quantum of errors, but more importantly, it emphasized on bridging the quality chasm. That is, it talked about the causes of the errors and how we could try to rectify them. It woke up the medical community by bringing to limelight the issue of patient safety in our healthcare system which had largely been ignored up until that point. Following the publication, the issue of patient safety gained massive public attention, and it became an area of primary uh, research and advocacy. Uh, it ushered in a culture of safety among healthcare professionals, like the implementation of hand washing, mandatory use of PPEs, uh, gloves, and all that. It also um, encouraged uh, world organizations like WHO and uh, national organizations in the country, like you have your Armstrong Institute in the US, or you have the NABH in India, uh, to set up an institute for checking quality of care of patients. Then, more importantly, the patient safety moment was born. The patient safety moment involved, could let the patients be stakeholders in the movement and be able to access their quality of care. For example, the Josie King Foundation, which is very common, very popular. Why am I talking about all of this? When we talk about defining moments in the history of medicine, we immediately think of those blinding lights, like remarkable surgeries, drastic wars, altering world-altering diseases, or any revolutionary procedures. They shine so bright that we sometimes let basic things like patient safety slip away into our blind spots. By opening up this issue, which is outside the comfort zone of healthcare professionals, but is very integral to them, the IOM report instilled a global change which touches every single patient who visits any healthcare facility, be it a tertiary care center or a rural health center. To add to that, the fact that this change was not brought about by one, any one singular person, but by a group of like-minded people involved in everyday care of patients is what makes this a truly defining moment in the history of medicine. Thank you.
So thank you, Varsha. Uh, a very important uh, historical significant moment you've chosen. Uh, I'm just a little worried. You, uh, have you plagiarized to err is human? And where is it plagiarized from? No, sir. The article's name itself is to err is human. So Why? I've used it as a reference. Why? Sir, because... Why did the uh, Indian... Why did the IO, the IOM use the title to err is human? So because Where did they take that from? I am not familiar with that, Who's sir. the author? The author is uh, Janet M. and uh, I believe no. Linda Khan. To err is human. And when you continue it, what is completed? Ma'am wants you to complete it. Uh, to err is human, building the, uh, bridging, crossing the quality chasm. No. What is the, okay. You have chosen a topic a little away from the common ones, but how do you say that it is a defining moment? Because we are talking today about moment. Yes, okay. You are talking about something which has, which is, you know, happened over a period. So that defining moment, if you were to choose, what you would say? The defining moment, I would say, is the release of the report because. When the report was released is when people all around the world started to understand the magnitude of what um, errors in the healthcare system does. Um, f we did not realize up until that point, we knew that there were errors that were made and there were adverse reactions because of those effects, but we did not realize just how many people we let slip into the cracks because of that. Last question, I enjoyed it. Last question, now that you know about the report, what is the one thing you'll do when you become a second year, third year student and you enter the wards, especially if you come to newborn ward? So I will make sure I follow all guidelines that What have, guidelines, yeah. Um, you have your... Give me one thing you'll do when you enter newborn ward. I will make sure I am fully covered in hazmat suits. I will make sure that I'm fully gloved. I'll make sure that I'm wearing a mask. I'll make sure that I don't touch things I'm not supposed to. <laughs> when you come, you are in which year at present? I'm in first year, ma'am. When you come to the third year, I always teach my students, and it, it, it is really important, know the contraindications rather than the indications. Indications we all learn. Hmm. We forget to learn the contraindications. So if you start with that, what not to do, it's equally important as what to do. Thank you, ma'am. Go say hello to Surya. Surya will tell you. Uh, thank you. Next participant, Mr. Tarun from AVMCH. His ID is 286. 286. Hello everyone. Before getting into my speech, I'd like to ask everyone a question. Have you ever come across an accident in your day-to-day -day life, not while you're working, because that's where they come here? You would see people who are not involved in that incident trying to do something to help in any way, to help in a You can see people with no involvement to that incident or the people involved in it trying to do something about it. We call them bystanders or spectators, if you will. Hi, I'm Tarun, and I'm here to talk about an important change brought about by a bystander. It was 1859. The Second, the second War of Italian Independence was just fought. It resulted in the victory of someone. That's not the issue at hand here. The issue is, it led, it led to the death and injury of 40,000 people who were simply just left behind to die. One man named Henry Dunant, a Swiss humanitarian, witnessed the horrifying aftermath. He mobilized the local population to tend to the wounded. He recorded his experience in a book, A Memory of Solferino. 
where he expressed his strong opinions for the need of an organization to provide relief for those in need and an international treaty to guarantee the protection of medics and hospitals in times of war. He sent copies to he sent copies of his book to many to many political and military leaders all across Europe. People he thought could help him make a change. The book prompted talks all around the world. A five person committee, including Dunant himself, sought to put this plan into action. Thus eventually forming the Red Cross. A year later, as the Swiss government conducted and organized an official diplomatic conference, including all European countries, United States and Mexico. The conference adopted the first Geneva Convention where the principle of medical neutrality was established. The implementation of medical neutrality has saved many lives since. We looked at how things were before this law was established at the beginning. Now if we turn to recent events or an, an incident that occurred on 9th March 2022, the Maripol Maternity Ward Asterisk. It resulted in the deaths of four, injured 16, and one stillbirth. We can look at how drastic the consequences are when this law is broken, and which is why I think the introduction of medical neutrality as a fundamental principle is truly one of the most important defining moments in medical history. Thank you. So your entire thing was on the principle of medical neutrality and the Red Cross. Yes. Okay, I'm going to ask you to fill in the blanks. Cross, Red Cross, Red Crescent, Red something else. Red Crescent? Red Crescent? So Red Cross, Red Crescent, and the third red, some shape. Never mind, it's fun. You should have a look at it. Tell us something about the Indian Red Cross Society. I, I don't know. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> is there any other organization which behaves very much based on the principle of medical neutrality but crosses borders also and crosses borders also? Uh, uh, doctors Without Borders? Very good. Thank you very much. Bobby Vishal, AVMC, and uh, his ID is 288288. Um, so, Good evening to everyone. I am Bobby Vishal. I feel so proud to stand in front of you in this uh, prestigious conference uh, to deliver a uh, topic on uh, restriction fragment length polymorphism, which is RFLP, as we all know. So it is a molecular diagnostic technique of genetic analysis, allows living beings to be identified based on unique pattern of restriction enzyme, which is a key role that acts in R uh, RFLP uh, technique. Imagine three decades back. Um, can we detect a probability of sickle cell disease in a progeny in a family? Or can we detect a precise suspect in a rape case? Or um, to identify evolution of m microbes and its disease virulence? If yes, how precise? And um, how, how can you be so uh, assured to that? Um, so moving on. Before the arrival of this technique, our people, our scientists ended up with miscalculations of finding the subjects that they have undergone. The microscopic analysis weren't enough to provide precise results and interpretation of the case study. After its arrival, the results were precise and satisfactory. So this is the man uh, who found RFLP technique. He is Alex Jeffrey. Uh, he found in 1984, and uh, this is the technique of RFLP. Could you change? 
um, apologies for the blur images uh, displayed there. Actually, it is uh, uh, RFLP uh, process that usually followed. Um, so how we can brush up with the basic concept of that. First, uh, a sample is collected and it goes through um, CPR technique and it further goes to restriction enzyme activities and uh, which, uh, which particularly cuts the region of DNA and further it undergoes gel electrophoresis that detects number of fragments and its relative sizes. So, um, the full RFLP processes requests probe labeling, DNA fragmentation, electrophoresis, uh, blotting, hybridization, and uh, radiography, etc. So this RFLP is uh, mostly tackled in forensic aspects, microbiological aspects, and um, of course, biotechnological aspects, uh, it should be. And major fields of uses is DNA fingerprinting um, to suspect to identify suspect evidences, sample collected in a scene of crime. And of course, paternity can be defined by this technique. And also we can find the origin of ancestry here. Um, and also, uh, under the genetic diversity, studying breeding pattern of the animals and uh, microbial life and its related disease can be found. The recent projects of RFL, RFLP in India that are genomic alternatives, alterations in uh, human meningioma, baculovirus P35 gene and cell death, and macroevolution and functional genomics of microbacterium tuberculosis, and gene line mutation of ocular disorders. And also the gene therapy in this RFLP uh, process is a significant thing in this topic. So it utilizes as genes or oligonucleotides sequences as therapeutic molecules instead of conventional uh, drug compounds. Um, it used to treat the defective genes which contribute to disease development. And also this therapy undergoes gene, augmenta gene augmentation therapy, um, targeted killing of suspe uh, specific cells and uh, target inhibition of a cell. So, Recent advancement to, is to treat breast cancer and uh, researchers to overcome type 1 diabetes mellitus, actually it, it is needed. Without these pioneers like Alec Jeffrey and uh, Botstein, we would never reach this kind of advancement in the medical field. This molecule technique is a gift or it makes things effect, uh, effectively sorted out for the welfare of the mankind. Lot, but, lot but not the least, uh, once Alec Jeffrey told that most scientific research is a slow, painful slog, a sort of three steps forward, but a two step backward. The truth slowly emerges from the gloom. Thank you, one and all. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Good topic you have chosen, good presentation. Can you tell me which aspect of Medical practice, it has changed in one word. You told about so many uses, it's used here and all that. Can you just put it in one word, which mm. aspect of precise clinical in diagnostic, uh, Precise in diagnosis. diagnosis. Actually, uh, according to the NCBI, they have told 99.5%, uh, uh, it gives uh, uh, assurance actually by this technique. So you don't need doctors, huh? No, ma'am. No history. No, no, <laughs> no examination. No, sir. This is a laboratory diagnostic, I'm saying. So why? We'll just send everybody for lab tests, uh, RPLF. What's the problem but, but also in need, India? But need a doctor for everything. Why? No, no, no. You defend it. You can't get away. I say you come to me, do an RPLF and come and meet me with a report. In fact, don't so meet me. Like just call me. Common people report. don't. What is the problem of RPLF when it comes to diagnosis in a setting in India, for example? So it's, uh, it's very expensive, actually. Thank and you very also much. It's, uh, so accessibility and affordability, both. But amongst the diagnostic techniques expensive. you've studied so much, what it has changed? Of course, the medical field. No, 
precisely mankind. so there were diagnostic tests whatever tests you are talking there were diagnostic tests earlier than that also it's pcr actually it was there actually so it has actually changed the sensitivity and specificity of this more specificity so excellent as you walking away just think who is your nearest cousin which species is your nearest cousin as per dna thank you you don't have i'm pretty sure you have okay well done thank you bobby now i call upon miss prachi she is from jipmer her id is 289 289 Good evening everyone. I am Prachi and I am going to be discussing about the defining moment in the history of medicine which I found the most fascinating. Next slide please. It was the 19th of December 1960 in Germany. The mother was finally relieved after giving birth to her daughter, but she was it was momentary when the nurse screamed, "Oh my god, why was this?" because the baby was born with limb abnormalities, a condition called as phagomelia. and external ear deformities amongst many other malformations numerous such observations were being made worldwide across 46 countries including canada australia uk and most important of all for this case germany but why was this happening this was happening because the mothers of the affected babies had been taking a drug called contergal in which the active ingredient was thalidomide thalidomide has been known in the medical history to be a fe fetal uh, harming drug which is proven to be fatal In the mid 1950s a German company called Chemik Gruenthal introduced thalidomide in the market as a non-barbiturate sedative hypnotic which was successful because of no hangover and drug dependency it was its defining quality was that it was safe so safe that it could be given uh, without the need of a prescription from the pharmacy soon its efficacy in morning sickness during pregnancy was proven and it became a popular anti emetic option for it as it had no side effects to the mother but now the hazardous effects were ran, uh, were revealed and the first report was in 1956 an australian obstetrician and pediatrician and german pediatrician simultaneously noticed uh, that uh, the thalidomide uh, use and deformities were correlated and it was first noted in 1961 then now we move on uh, to the modern era of fda where we see dr kelsey who an, uh, who was a very notable figure in uh, who was a no very notable figure during the course of the history she was responsible why thalidomide was never approved in the usa this was uh, she did not like the fact that uh, the drug did not prove any efficacy it had only safety but no efficacy However, in those days proving the safety of the drug was adequate. The companies argued that it was a safe drug as no matter what the conclusion uh, the connection of dose given to the uh, lab rats the drug was safe. Uh, on August 9 August 1st 1962 John F Kennedy made a nationwide announcement in a press conference uh, urging women to immediately stop the consumption of thalidomide. This paved way for the uh, Kefauver Harris amendments of the uh, October 1962, uh, which uh, laid the foundation in the modern-day FDA. It mandated companies to give complete details not only about the safety but also its efficacy, as thalidomide was not proven to be more efficacious than the other sedatives in the European market. It laid down the framework for the present-day clinical trials of phase one, two, and three, and importantly, mandated data on effects on the fetus and pregnant women, as the uh, as the scandal had shown, drugs can cross the placenta and cause harm, a concept which is early not known. These changes have become the gold standard for the entire world to follow since, and we have so far managed to dodge another such disaster. But all at the cost of 10,000 babies handicapped for life over a span of just five years, not forgetting the many miscarriages and stillbirths. With this, we come to the ending of the story of the thalidomide Thal scandal, which continues to be one of the largest man-made disaster in the history of medicine, and we have learned so much from it. Thank you. These are my references. Next slide, please. Thank you. obstetrician now thalidomide is not in use uh, 
during pregnancy it is not it to is be used consented. for other, it still has other indications as in leprosy it is used for uh, 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 le uh, re lepra reactions enl and it also used for multiple myeloma cll etc but it, but the disease has pokumulia has not disappeared uh, no can you can you correlate it with something else Sorry, which no? can cause pokumulia still uh, i am uh, not getting it now it's an autosomal recessive disorder. Okay. It's just not purely related to thalidomide. Yes. It can still occur spontaneously and it is an autosomal recessive disorder. Uh, okay. You read so much about it. Yeah, uh, good presentation about the thalidomide disaster. But I think you were allowed only two slides, but you used some three or four slides. Uh, well, I uh, huh? It was two slides, but I made it as an animation and put in the second slide, which is still a single slide. Okay. <laughs> because uh, I thought that the uh, conference good. was about innovative methods of storytelling and the animation, they said illustrations, animations were allowed. So I made the animation and put in the second slide. Very good. good. Uh, you have a knack of uh, telling a good story. Thank but uh, this thalidomide disaster, how has it changed the practice? What have they introduced after thalidomide disaster? Um, thalid uh, we know that pharma companies invest a lot during clinical trials and they uh, expect the, uh, the money to come back. That makes, them, uh, it's, uh, that makes it a very capitalistic environment and uh, more than the benefit of the patient, the benefit of the company is seen. In such, and in such cases, more, uh, re uh, reform uh, the FDA had to reform certain rules so that they can be regulated. Earlier, only safety was safety of the drug was needed. But now, even efficacy was to be seen because not just that this drug is safe, but uh, it was marketed earlier saying the drug is safe, you can have it, even if it was good for cancer or not. But now, it's needed to be proven that it is good, it is efficacious, and then take it. We had to compare the benefit versus risk ratio. If the benefit is high enough, then we can afford some risk, otherwise not required. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Now, every Today's last part has to be mentioned. The safety in the pregnancy specifically has to be mentioned, and the category has to be given in which category that drug falls. Uh, yes, ma'am, I have mentioned yeah. that in the slide. Thank you. Last participant of today's session, Mr. Vasant Lenin from Jipmer. His ID is 251. Hello, Chick. Hello, Chick. Okay. Good evening to one and all present here. I am Vasant Lenin, and I'm here to present the defining moment in the history of medicine, quest for organ transplantation, a historic battle. I call this a historic battle because organ transplantation wasn't discovered overnight. It was no accident. It took years with numerous setbacks, each setback paving way to enhanced understanding of various core medical topics. Let's have a look at this medical scenario. A person is diagnosed with end-stage renal disease. And you can see in 1900, what do we say him? I'm really sorry, we do not have any treatment options. Whereas today, we can tell him, lucky, we have a modality, the organ transplant. Like this, organ transplantation is very much used in today's world for many end-stage diseases. So with this, let us jump into the history behind this beautiful innovation, the organ transplantation. Let us have a look at how it all started. In 1600s, the thought of replacing one's tissue with another first was documented when Gasper attempted skin transplantation. He observed that uh, some of these grafts failed and when he compared between individuals, it was found that autographs performed much, much better than allografts. Uh, the basis of this was not known at that time and he referred to this as the force and power of individuality which in modern day transcribes to immunity and rejection. Now, with this, force and power not well understood, for the next 200 years, the only transplant that was done was skin. But how did all this change? How did the progress happen? This all changed when in 1883, Kocher was a physician who worked extensively on the thyroid gland and he performed thyroidectomy as a treatment for goiter. Following which he realized that his patients developed, as we all know, hypothyroidism. So what did he decide to do? He thought, okay, maybe we can transplant a good thyroid back to them. 
and transplantation was done. But he found out that within hours, the transplanted organ deteriorated. And this was due to lack of blood supply to the organ. And then an important conclusion was drawn. Blood must be diverted to the newly transplanted organ to keep it alive. Again, progress halted. What to do? How do we give blood supply to the new organ? This is where the breakthrough invention of anastomosis by Alex Carroll plays a very, very significant role. He discovered anastomosis. By this, we could suture blood vessels and divert bl blood to organs of our need. And he was so good that he was successful in transplanting kidney and heart to dog. And with this, the medical transplantation became very popular. And with increasing popularity, one thing always comes, a big problem, rejection. Graph rejection was a very big problem which emerged. And now multiple studies were conducted to, t to get to know more information about rejection and how do we tackle this. And on further studies, it was found that when transplantation was done to sick animals, the graphs were less rejected. That is, we had more acceptance rates. This eventually led to modern day topic, immunosuppression. That is, infectious diseases, radiotherapy and chemotherapy are used following transplant. And moreover, when they transplanted the same organ to the, to the person for the second time, the transplant was rejected much earlier, something we refer to today as second set phenomenon. With this and advances in immunology and the discovery of immune system, it paved way for the modern achievement, the first solid organ successful transplant in 1954, kidney transplant. Kidney transplant. During that time, there was no treatment for end-stage renal disease, and the only option was what they referred to as a surgical miracle. And that's what happened in the case of this identical twins, the Herrick brothers. He was a 23-year-old man diagnosed with end-stage renal disease, with no hope. However, John Murray advised him that maybe we can try for an experimental procedure to which his identical twin brother agreed, and it, and it was done. And he went on to live for eight long years which is very significant and the first successful transplant. Now what is so great about this is after this, things didn't stop here. Following this, within 10 years time, lung was transplanted, within 20 years time, pancreas and other organs followed. And the beauty of this is we are in the middle. We are not over and we have a lot to learn about organ transplantation, storage and improvise other methods. Thank you. I'm open to questions. Uh, how come when I require blood a transfusion, I don't need my twin. Thank goodness there's no twin, but the twin doesn't have to donate blood to me. How come? But yes, kidney sir. have to donate. Huh? Yes, sir, uh, uh, graft rejection is uh, cellular immunity. So whereas like uh, for blood transfusion, just cross-matching with ABO compatibility is enough, sir. Whereas in the level of tissues, we have to have HLA histocompatibility matching also. But in pack cell transfusion, why not HLA? I, what is HLA? Uh, human leukocyte antigen. So it's present on all cells, no? Yes, sir. Then how come when uh, you're giving transfusion without HLA testing? ABO compatibility is sufficient, sir. Why? Why not HLA? I heard that HLA is on the WBC. I think so, ma'am. I don't know. Unless something changed. Okay. I'm not sure. Okay. Which, uh, you know, nowadays organ uh, transplant is being promoted and very often you will read in the newspaper one life saved s or donation six more lives gave six more lives. what are those six organs i think it's seven now uh, later <laughs> latest i read recently it is seven uh, we have heart lung kidney pancreas no no once once uh, uh, kidney pancreas intestine Ah, skin. Skin. Uh, but I don't. Skin, skin and cornea are not included. Seven life-saving transplants and remaining other body parts which can also be transplanted. Okay, well done. Thank you. Thank you. So that comes to the end of the presentations. Can we give a big round of applause to the kids, please? Hey. You guys were fantastic. Actually, you know, we wish we had heard you before. Morning, so many people were talking about uh, students not being interested and uh, issues and all that. Yeah, we'll do. Sir, before you calculate, can we have the reflections from you about the session? We're very hungry. Yeah. No, but I, I think they should have.
informed in the beginning which year students, what is their uh, designation? Because you know that gives us an idea how, how much they. Did, I yeah, but I missed on. I think that is important because uh, it is important for the judges to know what what is their level of. Uh, but very well done. I must I must say, very well done. It's a very good. Uh, uh, what shall I say, event uh, Mahalakshmi for the undergraduates. So I should congratulate Dr. Mahalakshmi for her innovation, as usual, thinking of new ideas. Because it gives a platform for the medical students to first know about history. There's one such thing as history of medicine. It's a very beautiful topic for them to learn about how medicine has evolved. And it also gives them a chance to come out and speak in public, get over the inhibition, talk, answer questions, and all that. So I think there should be more such events. It's very nice and Yes, I think the credit goes to you. And of course, it gives a lot of uh, thought-provoking uh, uh, you know, inputs to the students. Today, if 10 students have thought of it. Tomorrow, 20 will think of it. So, yeah. okay, students, you all did a great job, uh, great selection of topics. You all came out very strong. Uh, you had slides which were much better than my slides. So, and you spoke well, most of you all spoke well. So you just have to get over being able to be fluent in your speaking and enjoy what you're doing and know your stuff. So really well done, uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. Nothing like learning from the past. Okay, so well done, congratulations again. One suggestion has come from one of the faculty who have been listening. They said these people are awesome. It takes only four minutes for this presentation. So if we can finalize the award winners, we'd make them present during some break or something tomorrow so that the whole crowd will get to hear. Because only few of us could hear this session. That's going to be very difficult because uh, I don't think you can actually select two that easily. I'm just getting the impression. They're really... Sir, we have only two presenters. Yeah, but you <laughs> give three, you know, Mahalakshmi, look at the gold <laughs> chandelier all over the place. What? Is, madam, what? Uh, Segal ma'am has decided to donate the third prize. Ah, okay, we're donating the third prize. Okay, can we have the kids coming and receiving the certificate? Yes. yes. Yeah. But you can do one Surya. thing. Uh, you can probably present it somewhere in the students' program so that more students, uh, you know, get motivated by it. Surya, Surya AE, please come forward to collect your certificates. AP Arun Praveen. Pratham L. Prakash. Jane, Jane Prabhash Shalom. Tarun, yes. Sir. 
பாபி விஷால் பிராச்சி வசந்த் லெனின் வசந்த் வசந்த் now i request dr arunachalam uh, dms and uh, hod department of community medicine to felicitate our judges dr sanjeev lenin Dr. Alka Segal, ma'am. Dr. Shanti. Dr. Sanjay, Sanjeev Lenin. Thank you, sir. Uh, that finishes the program for today. Tomorrow morning we'll announce the result once they calculate and tell us. Right? Thank you very much. Uh, please join us for the conference dinner. We have posted the invite in the participants' WhatsApp group.